morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship at First Parish in Medfield. I am not Dave Egan. <laughs> and he is not me, but he's preaching at our First Parish in Hingham, Old Ship Church, where, as most of you know, he was our intern a couple of years ago. We miss him a great deal, but we're happy that he's here. Happy for you that he's here <laughs> and for him. So welcome. Uh, it's good for me to be here. I've been in our first parish in Hingham for over 30 years. I've been here for about a half hour. <laughs> it's good, good to be with you uh, on this exchange Sunday. I will uh, say one thing. Dave and I spoke about this or emailed about this to encourage a variety of ways of friendly greeting these days other than handshakes. So I'm not going to shake your hand as you leave, but I'm happy to bow elbow bump, fist bump, <laughs> however else you want to create, and I think that's a wise thing uh, these days. So once again, welcome. Words of the Navajo blessing ceremony, beauty is before me, beauty behind me, above me, and below me, covers the beauty. I am surrounded by it. I am immersed in it. In my youth, I am aware of it, and in my old age, I shall walk quietly the beautiful trail. In beauty, it is begun. In beauty, it is ended. We have walked many paths or driven to be here this morning. Here we have gathered. And into this house of worship, we bring Whatever measure of joy or sorrow is uh, in part of our days, these days, may we feel held here. May we feel cared for here, held by one another, held by life and by the source of life, mystery beyond our knowing, held by the spirit of love, held by our love, held by love eternal. May it be so. May we join in the spirit of meditation and prayer. Spirit of life and love come unto us. As we approach the sound of silence, able to hear the quieter and beautiful sounds around us, rustling of clothes as we shift position. Breathing our own or our neighbors, a car driving by something like a rushing mountain stream. All this as we hold in our hearts and prayers, all those who lit a candle of sorrow, hold in our hearts and prayers the joys that we might share. Hold the larger sorrows of this world in which we live, the concerns, the anxiety in this time, allow ourselves to be lifted by the joys, by all that is beautiful, that is healing, that is loving. And we now enter into a time of silent reflection, meditation, and prayer. Thank you. 
from The Sovereignty of Good by the writer Iris Murdoch. She writes, Beauty is the convenient and traditional name of something which art and nature share, and which gives a fairly clear sense to the idea of quality of experience and change of consciousness. I am looking out my window in an anxious and resentful state of mind, oblivious of my surroundings, brooding perhaps on some damage done to my prestige. Then, suddenly, I observe a hovering kestrel. In a moment, everything <coughs> is altered. The brooding self with its hurt vanity has disappeared. There is nothing now but kestrel. And when I return, when I return to thinking of the other matter, it seems less important. And of course, this is something which we may also do deliberately, give attention to nature in order to clear our minds of selfish care. Here ends the reading. Here's a portion of Psalm 98, as translated or interpreted by Stephen Mitchell. Sing to the Lord a new song, for his miracles renew us each day. Justice, his justice is beyond comprehension, beauty beyond all praise. Shout to the Lord, all creatures burst forth in songs of thanksgiving. Sing out with violins and harps, praise God with a chorus of voices, with trumpets and the sound of the ram's horn, make joyful music to the Lord. Let the heavens and the earth rejoice, let the waves of the ocean roar, let the rivers clap their hands, let the mountains rumble with joy, let the meadows sing out together, let the trees of the forest exult in acknowledgement of the Lord whose justice is always present, whose truth hides beneath the surface, shining from the depths of the world, whose law pulses in the atom and extends to the outermost star. Well, hearing these words of the psalm I might suggest that actually everything in the world is just fine, beautiful, in order, as it should be, even perfect, but we know it's otherwise. We know it's not all just fine. It certainly doesn't feel that way. But here's the thing. A psalmist knew this about the world, too. He didn't just write one psalm. He knew well about suffering and injustice, knew everything was not beautiful. After all, many of the psalms are calls to God for help in the midst of suffering, yearnings of the heart for enemies to be vanquished, all wounds to be healed, for wrongs to be made right. Whoever wrote those psalms, David or someone else, knew all of this about the world. And the same question. Other psalms like the one we've heard are psalms of praise. He knew all of this, or she, about the world. How does this make sense? Well, it's very human, after all. You know, the old spiritual saint, swing low, sweet chariot, has a verse, sometimes I'm up, sometimes I'm down. It's human. It's who we are. For both moods, up and down, are part of the human experience, sometimes driven by circumstance, illness, or other life challenge, abuse, injustice, oppression, sometimes just the changing moods that come with being human. Now, for some, of course, changing mood is too weak a phrase, and seeking professional assistance is in order. But for most of us, most of the time, we can call on milder measures, you might say, to help us along the way, to help us, you might say, towards the light in a dark time or moment. One of those measures, the subject of my message today, of course, is to immerse ourselves in the sort of beauty that's evoked by the words of the psalm, or the words of the hymn we've just sung, or even just a glimpse, something beautiful in the moment. I love that Iris Murdoch reading. She looks out the window just by happenstance, and there's this hovering, this 
find this bird, this beautiful bird, hovering outside her window, and it changes her mood, her day. We all have such moments. Might not be at a kestrel, might be glancing up at snow-covered woods yesterday. Did you have snow here? We had a little bit in Hingham. Yeah. Like the first snow we've gotten this seriously strange winter since December. But it was lovely. Or glancing up at the moon. Have you been seeing the moon get bigger every night? And a few a little while ago last week, it was more or less in conjunction with Venus. Did some of you see that in the early evening? My goodness. Or it might be turning on the radio and hearing, or maybe absentmindedly, but a piece of beautiful music comes comes on that transports us away from whatever was troubling us. And as Iris Murdoch suggested, we don't have to wait for something beautiful, for that kestrel. Where's that kestrel? I need some change in my life. <laughs> or a sunset. When is that sun going to set so I can feel better? Or black or beetles. We don't have to wait for these just to come along. We can seek it out, of course. Seek it out in moments of distress or sadness or any kind. Beauty, after all, necessary. We know this intuitively. Necessary to our health and well-being spiritual well-being and physical, our wholeness as human beings. Now, I was 12 years old when President Kennedy was assassinated. As many of us looking around, a lot of you were quite around. We remember, well, it was a Friday afternoon that the news came through the radio or television, or in my case, it was over the loudspeaker in eighth grade English. We remember so clearly where we were. The halls as we went to homeroom were silent except for the shuffling feet. When I got home, I got off the bus and got to the back door. My mother greeted me in tears. I don't think I'd ever seen her cry. The next day or two, our television was on for most of the time. We were immersed in this unspeakable news. Then on Saturday afternoon, or it might have been Sunday, I'm not sure, my parents decided we should drive out to Long Island Jones Beach. I lived on Long Island, grew up there, and it was about a 20-minute drive. It's a beautiful day. Again, some of you remember that. It's so beautiful. And we immersed ourselves, instead of in the news, in the beauty of the beach, the bright sun, the blue sky, the waves, the white sand. We walked along the edge of the sea, waves crashing, that never-ending, peaceful roar, and then we drove home. Our visit to the beach, held by the beauty of sand and sea and sky, did not, of course, change the terrible event. Nothing could. Nor did it take away our sadness. Of course not. Nor was it the only element at play that afternoon. It was being together. For me, it was in the safety of my parents' company. All of us being together. All had their part to play. But the simple beauty in which we had immersed ourselves was just as essential and was healing. I mean, we were together in front of the TV set, but we needed beauty at that moment, helping us to endure the sadness. About a decade later, a dear young friend with whom, of our family, with whom I had been very close, died. My father again suggested heading to the beach, just we two. By that time, we were both runners, so we ran along the edge of the waves on another beautiful day, late summer day, and again, neither the loss nor the sadness went away, and the companionship and the running, just that physical activity had their part to play, but we were better able, I think, both to hold the loss and sadness, to hold both loss and sadness in the presence of beauty and the expanse of sea and sky. All these memories, all these memories remind me of one of Mary Oliver's poems, maybe not as often shared as some of her others. It's, it's a short poem called, I Go Down to the Shore. She wrote, I go down to the shore in the morning, and depending on the hour, the waves are rolling in or moving out, and I say, oh, I am miserable. What shall, what should I do? And the sea says, in its lovely voice, excuse me, I have work to do. <laughs> I love this poem. I return to it in my mind often, recall her lines when I go down to the sea, actually go down to the sea 
for peace or solace or just imagine going down to the sea. It seems to me that the poem echoes the reading we heard from Iris Murda, which ends with the thought that in giving ourselves over to something beautiful and large, too, in the case of the ocean, in nature, we are able to, as Iris Murda put it, clear our minds of selfish care. It's not that we ought not to care for ourselves, but there's we can get so in turn, so narrowly focused, and it doesn't help us, doesn't help anybody. Elsewhere, Murdoch named this unselfing, unselfing. But whatever we call it, we've shifted from our sometimes narrow, too narrow experience of what's going on to a more expansive view of what's going on and who we are. Looking at the moon or Venus, as I was saying, and that, that just, if I'm home late from a meeting, and maybe a good meeting, but it was late and I was tired, and I walked just from the car to our back door, it's a short walk, but you know, the stars are <laughs> shining, <sighs> just breathe a little more. Beauty lifts us out of ourselves. Emerson put it this way in a lecture on beauty, he said, the question of beauty takes us out of surfaces to thinking of the foundation. Of course, it's not only beauty in nature, we've already alluded to this, that has healing power. It can take us out of ourselves, out of our too narrow selfishness. All forms of beauty can have this effect. All the arts to begin with, we talk about mu music with the kids. Each Sunday, one, I think one of the reasons we come, uh, not necessarily for the words, but for the music, for, and for being together, the company, the beauty of our surroundings, and for the music and singing, each Sunday during worship, we're aware particularly of the power of music. We don't often enough, most of us sing in a group, which has its own salutary effect, bringing us together. But it's the beauty, too, of singing together. What power. So I suspect this is true for all of us. I know it's true for me that music, whether here or in a concert hall or in a CD or even on our little phones, enhances our lives, sometimes just helps us on the way. Another story from a long time ago, one summer during my years as a camp counselor in the Adirondacks, I was feeling pretty low. I can't remember why, but I was 18 or 19 years old. It could have been almost anything. <laughs> <laughs> my night off came along and I tagged along with my older brother Jim, who was also a counselor, and some other counselors who were going to a a concert at the Saratoga Performing Arts Center. Any of you been to the Saratoga? Yeah, it's a wonderful setting with the lawn extending in the back. And we were, we were there to hear the band, not just any band, the band. <laughs> <laughs> Got to see that new documentary, right, the Robbie Roberts. The music, wonderful music, took me out of myself. I returned to camp changed. I use that word, change. No longer so low. Seeing the world with fresh eyes, I think, unselfed a bit. Music had done its work. Now these days, uh, raise your hand if this isn't true for you, sometimes I've had more than enough news of the day. <laughs> and even knowing this, too easily I get in the car to go to a meeting or drive from here to there or visit someone or just do errands or head home and I turn on one of the news stations, GBH or WBUR. And soon, sometimes I just feel it's too much. It weighs me down, so I switch to music. Maybe classical on CRB or UMB for folk. Or I pop in a CD. A little while ago, I was revisiting Sgt. Pepper's. I'm dating myself all over the place this morning. <laughs> There's always a bluegrass CD close at hand, or Pete's here, or Mozart. That's really dating myself. <laughs> It takes only a few measures and I can breathe again. Listen to the news, you, tight, you physically can tighten up. Music, you can breathe. As I often say these days, I know enough, help, we need to know enough news to help us be good citizens. More than that doesn't necessarily help more. I need beauty, I need beauty to heal my soul which in the end also helped me to be a better citizen, better activist, better person, I think. Because being weighed down and depressed by the news 
does not lead to better citizenship or activism, and it certainly doesn't make you better company. <laughs> the point here is not to anesthetize myself to the bad news. I don't want to hear any more of it, I'll listen to music. <laughs> Points not to anesthetize to any bad news, whether personal or political, including relating to oppression or injustice in the world or suffering in the world or in our lives. Quite contrary, for to become too immersed, that word again, in pondering the world's suffering or your own can immobilize. We've all had that experience. Can immobilize us. That does no one any good. And further, the world, as someone once said, does not need people, does not need more people who are disheartened and depressed by events. No, the world needs people who are alive and awake to everything, including to suffering with open hearts, not hearts closed by too much suffering, but open to that which moves us. To put it another way, in challenging times, we may be in danger of neglecting the healing and inspiring power of beauty in our lives, whether music, art, poetry, or in the woods and fields, or the beauty of one another's faces. But to neglect, to enrich our lives with beauty, perhaps viewing beauty as a frill, then there are important things, then there's this frill, that's nice. And there are more important things, though, to tend to. But this is to do harm to our souls, as well as to our ability, as I've said, to, to tend to those important things. morning, not just when I was talking to the kids, that you've been perhaps bringing to mind or soul or heart beauty in your lives. I hope you have been. Continue to do that. I want to draw to a conclusion, though, with a few, just a few philosophical reflections on the ancient triumvirate of beauty, truth, and goodness. I expect we'd all easily agree, I hope all, that the virtue of truth is necessary to well-functioning lives and families and nations. Likewise, the virtue of goodness. But have we thoughtlessly, once again, have thoughtlessly considered beauty to be somehow less important, a pleasant extra, but unnecessary as compared to truth and goodness? Well, we were wrong if we did. For just as we're nourished in our lives by truth and goodness, so we are nourished by beauty. All three virtues this ancient Greek triumvirate necessary to health and wholeness. And these qualities or virtues are interrelated, intimately interrelated. I read that for scientists, mathematicians, the elegance or beauty of a theorem suggests its likely truth. I love knowing that. If you've got competing, competing theories, not necessarily proof, but this is elegant, this is beautiful more likely to be true. And in speaking the truth, or observing someone else speak the truth, whether in our personal relationships or in the midst of politicized conversation, it's certainly a good moral thing to do, the truth and goodness, but also beautiful to behold. A couple of months ago, we observed those dignified public servants in the hearing rooms of Congress speaking the truth which was good, it was also beautiful. So that's beautiful. Indeed, isn't any moral or ethical act a good act, a beautiful thing to observe on which to participate? As simple a gesture as taking someone's arm, uh, someone who's unsteady to cross the street, or observing this, you observe someone helping someone else, and you say, that's beautiful. I mean, it's good, but it's also beautiful. Goodness and beautiful, and beauty, joy. So finally, I'd affirm that, I would affirm that it's no accident that we have evolved, whether by the natural selection of millions upon millions of years of evolution or by some creative design, no accident that we've evolved to respond to beauty, to seek beauty, to create beauty, whether in a work of art, piece of music, speaking the truth, helping a neighbor, or working for justice. After all, just as the Parthenon or this church owes much of its beauty to 
elegant and proportionate construction of its various elements, whether it's stone or wood, isn't justice about proportion and balance and <clears throat> beauty in human relations. Well, whatever else you leave with today, your own visions of beauty, I invite you to leave with the reminder from that Navajo blessing I shared at the outset to notice and appreciate beauty before us, <coughs> beauty behind us, all around us. To notice beauty in our youth, in our age. This reminder to walk quietly the beautiful trail. For in beauty it began and beauty it will end. All with the psalmist, even and maybe especially in a world with its share of sorrow and suffering, as the heavens and earth rejoice, the waves of the ocean roar, the rivers clap their hands, the mountains rumble with joy, the meadows sing out together, the trees of the forest exult, praise be. May it ever be so. Aware of the many ways in which we are blessed in our lives in the midst of whatever measure of joy and sorrow, blessed by beauty, blessed by truth, blessed by goodness and examples thereof. May we turn and make of our lives a blessing to all life. So may it be, blessed be, amen. amen. Thank you.